Thank you. Good afternoon. I hope you're enjoying the conference and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to some great presentations and papers uh, over the next few days. Today I'll be talking about concrete bridges in the new millennia, the imperative for innovation. So let's get underway. I'd like to talk about um, some of the global imperatives for bridge design and construction, such as global warming and sustainability, uh, the growth of autonomous vehicles. We're on the cusp of a rapid growth, the use of autonomous vehicles. Uh, some features of autonomous construction and where that might be going. Concept of zero maintenance bridges some new materials that will complement concrete and uh, the implications of higher concrete and reinforcing grades that just continue to increase. This is the Pantheon uh, constructed in Rome in 128 AD. This structure remains the largest unreinforced concrete dome in the world, a fantastic example of the durability and strength of concrete. Concrete, the most successful uh, bridge material uh, ever developed. Back when the Pantheon was built, the world's population was around 300 million. Today, it's 8 billion people and we are adding another billion people every 12 years and we have been uh, since the turn of the century. Um, and this is not just in uh, developing countries. If you look at uh, countries such as Australia, closer to home, uh, we are growing the population at a rate uh, never before seen. And yes, we've had a blip due to COVID, um, a blip that will overcome and um, be back on, back on track for record population growth. Coupled with this, of course, is the concept of urbanisation. And when you think that only back in the 19th century, 14% of people lived in cities and consider today that this is over 50% and the birth rate is double. By 2050, a little over a generation away, the proportion of city dwellers will be 70% and the world's population <coughs> will have grown to three point to six billion dollars from three to six billion people from 3.5 billion today. That's in a little over a generation. So what does that mean for us? That means there will continue to be an unprecedented demand for transport infrastructure, particularly bridges. And if we look at this slide with the impetus of population growth and urbanization on the left and the influence on four, what I've termed their four global imperatives on the uh, next column in, and let's look at um, some of the innovative responses that are coming to bear. First one is worker safety. Um, we are concerned about the safety of people more today than ever. And we can witness that in what's happening with the COVID situation. With regard to maintenance of bridges, the new norm will be zero maintenance. Zero harm equals zero maintenance. Can we produce zero maintenance bridges? I believe we can, and I'll give you some examples in a little while. Um, we're also looking coupled with this concept of no harm, smart bridges, smart bridges that don't require inspection, smart bridges that will tell us about their deteriorated state, will tell us about the loading that they've experienced and are experiencing. And a couple of this is the increase in cost of labor. 
So an impetus on computational design and digital solutions. Rapid requirement for infrastructure is also speed of construction. Speed of construction is now almost as important in a number of cases as cost of construction. And speed of construction, DFMA, modular construction, construct off-site, assemble on-site will become much more um, predominant. Uh, coupled with modular construction is lightweight. If it's modular, it's going to be lifted into place. It's going to be lifted into place. Um, weight, mass is important. And structural efficiency, not just to reduce costs, but also to reduce lifted mass. Global warming is upon us. I think that is now without controversy and global warming can be influenced by the materials in which we select. Um, so this goes to the heart of sustainability. It is recognized now we've got finite, we've got finite resources. Uh, what are some of the new materials that we can use to complement uh, concrete um, to assist with sustainability? Um, what are some of the uh, things that we can think about to reuse uh, bridges when they've reached the end of their uh, functional life uh, rather than straight demolition. And autonomous vehicles. Um, autonomous vehicles have implications for safety and also for uh, loadings and standards in the design uh, of bridges um, for this mode of transport. All of this, of course, is uh, needs to be factored in around cost and uh, optimization. So let's look at sustainability. Uh, I like this uh, definition from the United Nations um, sustainability development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So in our rush to build this infrastructure that I've shown has a great need, are we compromising in some instances um, the ability of, of, of future generations? And I think it's fair to say in a number of cases we are. If we're looking at global warming, without doubt it's happening and without doubt it can be reduced by a reduction in CO2 production. What are some of the considerations we should be thinking about? Well, clearly uh, concrete ranks pretty well as far as um, embodied energy is concerned, embodied energy representing the total carbon dioxide release during the resource extraction, manufacturing, fabrication and assembly. Um, relatively low embodied energy uh, per tonne. But the issue with concrete is it's so successful, we use so much of it. If we can reduce the uh, amount of concrete we're, that we're using or reduce the embodied energy per tonne, then it has, a, it has the potential to have a significant effect on global emissions. And an easy win here is uh, supplementary cementitious materials such as fly ash and uh, blast furnace slag, both, both, both uh, byproducts. And you can see with the table there in the bottom left that um, a simple uh, addition of fly ash, 25% fly ash um, to replace Portland cement reduces the embodied energy by around about 20%. That's gotta be worth doing. It, it, it not only assists in reducing embodied energy, but allows a lower heat of hydration, so less tendency for early age uh, cracking. And we're also utilizing what's essentially a, a waste product. So promotion of SCMs, uh, obvious. To take it one step further though, is to essentially look at eliminating Portland cement by the use of geopolymers. And you can see the um, 
embodied energy per ton for geopolymers is substantially less than, than that for cement. In Australia, Wagner's uh, leading the charge here with uh, their proprietary geopolymer product that they're using for both precast and cast in situ applications. And uh, we've uh, designed a bridge that has been built using geopolymer concrete uh, for piles, abutments, superstructure uh, at Kyogle in, in northern New South Wales and appears to be um, doing really well. I, I understand this may be the first use of um, geopolymers for bridge construction, at least in, in New South Wales. And um, we, we're, we're very happy with the result. And uh, I'd like to think this might be the forerunner for, um, uh, for future, future use of geopolymers. And I take my hat off to, to Wagner's for leading the charge here. While we're talking about sustainability, uh, it's worth thinking about steel because uh, concrete invariably is married to steel as uh, reinforced concrete. And looking at the embodied energy of steel, um, approximately 12 times um, that of, uh, of concrete. Um, the tendency is to consider that um, for a given reinforced concrete um, member, let's say in bending, it may be better to provide more concrete, increase the depth and, uh, and provide less steel reinforcement, steel being the, the higher embodied energy. Now we've done some studies at Oricon and indications are in fact, the reverse is true that um, embodied energy is in fact, um, let's say optimized by providing more steel reinforcement and, um, and, and less concrete. And there, I've got a table here that uh, gives you some, some details. Um, in addition, we've also found that embodied energy is reduced using higher strength steels and indeed using higher strength concrete. Not in all cases, but as a general rule, um, as a guideline, perhaps uh, something to, to take forward. There's uh, some interesting trends when we look overseas with um, concrete girder bridges, and I pull these out, especially concrete girder bridges, um, the most common bridge type in Australia, precast girders uh, spanning generally between, between about 10 or 12 metres and 40 metres, either with planks or super tees or I girders or U girders. And what's interesting here is the use, um, the increased use of SPMTs for the transport and erection of, um, of precast girders. Uh, this means we can lift heavier and longer members. We can transport heavier and longer members. And when I look in the US, where um, they're effectively transporting and lifting 70 meter span uh, precast girders, um, I can see I can see certainly a trend um, in Australia to to follow suit. The other thing they're doing in the US, and you can see in that photo in the bottom right, is the use of curved U girders, curved precast U girders. And uh, there's, a, there's a photo there in the top right. <clears throat> uh, this enables um, precast longitudinal girders to be used uh, in lieu of what would otherwise perhaps be a much more expensive precast segmental solution, particularly for um, shorter length viaducts. Painting is being used for concrete in um, increasing use overseas. Um, I know people have a strong view on this, but um, there's no doubt that painting really enhances the appearance. And um, uh, if, it, if we're using something like a photocatalytic coating, it will also enhance the, uh, the durability. So something also to, um, to consider. Um, I'd like to talk about um, higher concrete grades. When I, in fact, had my first year out as a young bridge engineer 
many years ago in the 1975, 5,000 PSI concrete was um, considered high strength. Uh, in bridges today, we'd use 40 or 50 MPA as uh, without without even without even thinking about it as a as a status quo. In 2004, the Australian Bridge Standard um, provided um, provisions for 65 MPA, and in the latest revision of the standard, we've now allowed up to um, 100 MPA. Can I, and look, there's some advantages in that, clearly um, I, uh, a higher uh, characteristic strength means we can, uh, we can strike the forms um, more early. So there's a construction advantage there. And the uh, increase in elastic modulus means that the flexions um, will be less. And uh, there is some, some reduction in creep and shrinkage and and, and, there's, and there's clear uses for long span bridges. But uh, generally for small to medium span bridges, the majority of bridges that are being constructed in Australia, uh, the, the high strength grades, I think, have, have um, limited benefit. And I've listed, listed, in fact, some disbenefits there that um, there is more cement, um, the heat of hydration uh, will increase the preponderance of early age cracking uh, will increase. Um, under the 2017 Australian Bridge Standard, there's no advantage in specifying concrete over 50 MPA for durability. Um, and even for strength, um, the strength gain is diluted um, for strengths over 65 MPA. So think twice before automatically going to um, those higher strengths. Let's look at uh, concrete girders and where that might go, particularly in Australia in the coming future. And certainly the incumbent here is Super T girders. We know them well, um, very cost effective in that 25 to 35 metre uh, range, uh, low maintenance, um, relatively efficient section and, and, and certainly that ability to have an immediate work platform once you're erected. Um, so there's, there's a number of advantages with, um, with super T's, but we also need to consider that when you're looking at an incumbent, an incumbent that people are automatically selecting, perhaps there are some disadvantages that might give room for innovation and all, indeed alternative uh, cross sections. And let's have a look at some of these disadvantages, um, particularly um, with reference to efficiency because um, the uh, top flange extensions, which provide that nice little working platform, um, those extensions don't really assist in, in, um, in strength. So, so there's an automatic inefficiency there with the uh, girder cross section. Uh, in addition, uh, these girders are very unstable uh, on, a, on erection and need careful bracing uh, through the erection process. Uh, there has been instances where Super T girders have toppled over during construction. Uh, they require a, a tapered plate to um, provide that horizontal uh, bearing surface between the sloping soffit and the top surface of a horizontal bearing. Uh, in some uh, state jurisdictions, uh, heavy end cross girders are required, which certainly takes away from the cost advantage. And invariably, um, there's a large, heavy uh, cross head required, which adds cost and indeed um, detracts from the appearance of these bridges, particularly um, in viaduct construction. So, Look, uh, I think it's certainly worth looking at, um, at options to super T's and project that we did uh, very recently um, with upgrading the Pacific Highway on the east coast of Australia. We um, had a 11 metre wide uh, bridge. In fact, there were twin bridges 11 metres wide. Um, the option was uh, five super T's, um, 80 80 tonne each, that's 400 tonne. Uh, and we looked at that 
and and indeed develop the um, what was known as the UMAX. So instead of five girders, just two U girders. Um, the uh, precast forming for the deck using using trans floor. You can see a substantial simplification of the of the substructure there. Um, the fact that we only need two girders instead of five, we, we need less bearings. Um, and indeed the um, soffit of that U is, is flat, not, not uh, sloping with the, uh, as per the, um, the, the super T. And so there's an automatic inherent stability with the UMAX girders that just aren't there with uh, super T's. And look, I'm really telling is um, the fact that uh, we actually stretch these up to 42 meters. Um, so um, 280 ton of UMAX at 42 meters compared to 400 ton of super T's at uh, 38 meters, uh, there was a, a clear winner there. So I think there are alternatives, uh, some very good alternatives in fact, uh, to super T's, and I and I encourage, in fact, people to uh, to look at to look at that, and not just simply jump to the status quo. Um, higher strength reinforcing grades again increasing. Um, they've been around that five hundred that five hundred N grade reinforcement's been around for a while now. Very very good steel, very reliable ductile uh, steel. Uh, Liberty One Steel are now producing uh, steel uh, 600 and 800 grade, and there's obvious advantages in that. Um, permitted with some restrictions in AS 3600, so clearly a lower tonnage um, with a, a cost per tonne similar, very similar as I understand for the high strength to to the normal 500 grade, there's a, a lower cost, there's a inherent lower embodied energy and less reinforce, reinforcement congestion in the, in the mould. So, all, you know, they're all really good things. Um, before we jump on them though, um, just be careful. Um, number one, um, not yet permitted in the um, AS5100 Australian Bridge Standard, although we're looking at that right now. And there certainly will be, uh, will be some provision in the, in the Bridge Standard. Uh, please be careful with, uh, with crack widths. Uh, the Bridge Standard does limit um, steel reinforcement stresses in situations where we're looking to uh, limit, limit crack widths. Uh, so you may find that you, you can't get that benefit. And uh, you also just need to be clearly careful with, um, with deflections. Other than that, uh, looks, looks a very good product. I'll talk a little bit about integral abutments in the con context of zero maintenance. And I spoke about that earlier. Um, as a society, we are increasingly, and with very, very good reason, clearly, uh, concerned about the safety of workers, maintenance workers, construction workers. Um, and yet on our bridges today, on our most common bridges today, um, we've got two elements that don't generally see the um, life of the structure and they are the deck seals and the bridge bearings. Integral abutments um, obviate the need for both. Um, and the longitudinal um, movements uh, taken up generally by, by simple uh, flexing of the abutment. So look, that's got to be something worthwhile. Integral abutments, um, very, very popular and, and, and strongly used in North America and Europe, particularly England. Um, we haven't really caught on to the um, the ready use of integral abutments and integral bridges in Australia, they are, they are in increasingly being used, but can I, uh, can I certainly encourage, encourage their, their use? You'll, you'll end up with a product such as this one here, um, 
for the that we designed for the Peninsula Link project in um, in Victoria. Um, no bearings on deck or, or deck joints. Um, a, a concrete structure, uh, virtually virtually no no maintenance. Let's talk a bit about 3D printing and the image here, um, a few people have sent this to me over the last couple of weeks, actually. This is in Amsterdam across one of the canals. Um, it's actually a steel, stainless steel um, structure that was 3D printed um, in the shop and brought to site and lifted into place. And look, I applaud um, I applaud the owners, I, I applaud the, the designers and the contractors for this. Uh, but when you, you think it through, um, this, this structure um, essentially um, had to comprise melted, effectively melted steel, um, very high energy in the fabrication, um, the surface, um, is very rough, very difficult to apply a, um, a finish without some form of compromise as far as corrosion protection is concerned. And I, I, I would say that's the reason why they've used uh, stainless steel. So look, a very expensive um, um, bridge, um, uh, certainly novel, but um, in my view, not 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 really sustainable. What is sustainable is 3D concrete bridges, 3D printed concrete bridges. And I show a beautiful example here uh, done by a consortia led by Zaha Hadid in, in Venice, um, which comprised uh, hundreds of um, essentially precast units, all 3D printed, uh, and assembled in such a way that they're all in compression. So, um, and clearly with 3D printing, there is a issue there of the difficulty um, in um, with a clash with reinforcing and the, and the 3D printing, but that was overcome here um, by, by just having everything in compression. And when you compare the alternative of having a, having to form up each of those hundreds of units, and they're all individual, um, then it, it certainly makes um, the 3D printing option um, much, much, much more viable. I think we'll see a lot more 3D printed uh, concrete bridges uh, around the world. So uh, stay tuned for more information on that. Um, lastly, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about autonomous vehicles and that there's certainly um, convenience in, in autonomous vehicles and there will be a, a strong take up. There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, the, the, what I'd particularly like to talk about though is the effect on transport infrastructure because if you consider that if you've got a viaduct that is only comprised of, of autonomous vehicles that can be centrally controlled to prevent um, vehicles getting on and off the structure, uh, then it makes a very efficient structure because uh, clearly the, the autonomous vehicles can move uh, closer together, both longitudinally and transversely. So it's a much more efficient uh, transport system. Um, as a result of uh, limiting what uh, the vehicles on the bridge, then um, uh, if it's just passenger vehicles, then uh, we're not designing for that one-off um, heavy SM1600. Um, we're designing for, uh, for vehicles probably less than 15 tonne, which can make for a much more efficient uh, viaduct structure um, because of the certainty on the the much more certainly on the position of the of the vehicles, we can um, we can have lighter barriers, we can have a lighter structure, we can have reduced collision load uh, on piers, um, and and all of this lends itself to um, to light modular uh, construction technique. There are people that will say that uh, perhaps the joy of driving is such that autonomous vehicles will not take on like they 
like they could, but I think a strong imperative there is uh, safety. And here's some numbers for you to have a think about. This is my, my last slide. Uh, there's around about a billion cars and trucks in the world today, give or take. Um, those billion cars and trucks mean that there are 1.3 million people dying um, from road accidents every year and 40,000 people per day are injured and disabled. By the use of autonomous vehicles, um, it's been estimated, and I've just listed one of the references there, but there are several, that the fatalities could be reduced by 95% um, by using autonomous vehicles. And when you consider the implications of eliminating those accidents, as far as fatalities and injuries are concerned, a very compelling case for autonomous vehicles. Thank you. Um, Appreciate the opportunity to present today and uh, I wish you well um, through what looks to be an excellent um, conference as we move forward. Thank you.